My name is Eliana Zerman, and I'm about to interview Vern Dexter at Glades Healthcare Center in Florida. Vern Dexter was born on February 28, 1924. My dad, Brian Zerman, is filming, and Vern's wife, Jeanette Dexter, is also helping out. Hello, what's your full name? Vernon L. Dexter. What war were you in, and what was your branch of service? I was in World War II as an Army Air Force pilot. Then I was in Korea for the Korean campaign, and I was a lieutenant, first lieutenant, but we were flying then for the Air Force Academy instead of with the Army Air Force. In other words, in 1948, they made uh, the Army Air Force into a sodality, uh, and they called it the United States Air Force. So where did you serve? Where did I serve? Yeah. Uh, of course, ground school training was on here in the United States, but overseas I was stationed in a little town called Steperone. It was up on the hill. If you were looking for it on the map, it would have a hard time. But it was over near the heel of the boot of Italy, and um, we had kind of a uh, single runway because of the mountain area that we were in, mm -hmm. and um, really basically uh, orchard at one time, and we kind of ruined the orchard. so. Uh, they uh, didn't get too mad at us at that, but uh, we we had a good time there in, in Stepperon. How old are you, and what years did you serve? I joined the uh, Army Air Corps in 1942 because at that time we had what was called the draft and that was for enlisted personnel uh, to serve in the Air Force, in the Army, in the Marines, in the Coast Guard and any other type of military service that they could think of. But really the, the uh, Air Force was an army institution uh, up until 1948. How old are you right now? <laughs> 94 and uh, 11 months. <laughs> and um, I'll be 95 in another month. When's your birthday? February the 28th. I wasn't born on a leap year, however, that particular year I was born was a leap year year. Where were you born? Um, in St. Mary's Hospital in Salt Lake City, Utah. Tell me about your family. My family? My Growing father uh, was a... Uh, surveyor. Uh, my mother never went to school, didn't work. Uh, very few people who really and at that age uh, went to work, but uh, um, when the war started, well, uh, that all changed. And now you have uh, a, a real clamor for women to be in the employment and in the working industrial area. So, um, uh, but in, in, uh, when I came along, I, uh, women in the house stayed home and took care of the kids. Nowadays, the kids take care of the mamas. How old were you when you started to work? How old was I when I started to work? Well, there was the time when I was uh, in the uh, grade school and seven, 
uh, I was about eight, seven, eight years old, I started selling uh, ladies' home journals and uh, Saturday Evening Post. Now we had to have a little walking around kind of territory, and I would have to go around and deliver the book, collect the money, and go on. Because uh, we had to pay for the magazine whenever we picked them up. And so I, I'd have to kind of scrounge around and get my money. And uh, we actually got a, a penny a magazine. Mm-hmm. Now, when I would sell 10, 15, 20 magazines, uh, I took that money home with me and I put it in a little jar, a little compote in, in the closet. And it never got filled. And I wondered why. And my, and my mother needed money. She always went to my little compote and got what she needed. So I decided that that was the wrong type of work to have. Did your siblings work? No, not really. None of them worked uh, until they were married and, and went that way. Uh, uh, Jack went to school, Keith went to school, Lucille did not get to school, uh, she was married and uh, couldn't go, but then there was me, I come along and by the time I started to work, the Japanese put a big break on that and started a war. But um, it was kind of a difficult time out there. This was after the big depression and a lot of the people were really hurting and uh, it was a hard time for the world to recover. How were you doing during the Great Depression? In the Great Depression? I felt like by selling the magazines and getting my penny a magazine, I was doing great. I was happy with my money that I was getting. And I was going to really save it and do a lot of things with it. But uh, as I said, that little compote never got full. And and, uh, Mama admitted later that she don't know how much money she took out of it. But she managed to uh, go to the grocery store and use my my money that she decided to borrow. Didn't ask me to borrow it, but she decided. Tell me about your second job. Well, that was a good little job that I had there. Um, my father had a friend that was in the car repair business, and so the, he took me on as a parch cleaner upper and that sort of nonsense. This was uh, when I was in uh, middle school. Now, we had... Uh, grade schools, middle schools, and high school. And I was in middle school, so I wasn't too old. I was probably around, probably around 10, 11, 12. And what I did is I worked after school. I would go in there and then wash parts, auto parts for him. And then on uh, Saturdays, he was open a half day, so I would go in at 8 o'clock in the morning and I would clean the place up and scrub it and stuff like that. Uh, he paid me 50 cents a week. And I thought that was great money to, to get paid 50 cents a week. But I enjoyed working there and, and I really I, I was able to learn a lot from him uh, about positions and getting into the work and doing certain things and I really really he's the one that started me off on on working phase I had always been interested in aircraft and I used to uh, build model airplanes and try and fly them and finally uh, Al Stanbridge, the, who I worked for in the auto business, had an airplane and flew. And um, uh, one Sunday he took me out and 
uh, we went flying in his little tailor craft, and uh, uh, that was where I first learned to fly and, and got the, the bug that, yes, this is what I want to do. And I, even when I went to college uh, later on, uh, I, I still wanted to fly, and uh, I went to the um, university that had its own little aircraft, and uh, we could pay the way, pay the money, and take a flight and learn how to fly at school. So I had a little bit of air training before I ever got into the military. Now, getting into the military was a real choice that I made. Uh, in high school, I belonged to the ROTC unit that was uh, at the high school. It was a marching military band. Now, when the war started, I looked at what we were doing and realizing that my draft number was going to come up, and therefore I said, I'm not going to go to the walking man's army. I'm going to join the Air Force. And of course, I didn't ask my mama or anybody else. I just did it. And I took the examination, uh, written an examination in Salt Lake, and uh, passed. And the man said, well, you'll just have to wait for when we need you. We'll call you. Call me. <laughs> and they did. Six months later, I got a call to go to the Army. And that's how I got started in the Air Force. Tell us about your training. Well, training was a real good thing. The only thing was uh, we started out whenever it called back uh, uh, to enter. You had to go through basic training, which was military style. Uh, went to a barracks in Merced, California. And there we had to learn to walk, how to march, how to do the calisthenics, how to do uh, military protocols, military studies, <laughs> which were different than the way we did it in school. And so uh, uh, I, I really had, a, a, as a young man, not knowing a whole lot, I had a lot <laughs> to learn, and it was a difficult time for me to uh, get in and, and get started. But after uh, going in and then going through the various stages, uh, uh, I was able to learn. Uh, the first stop was uh, a base called uh, Verona. It was in uh, uh, South Los Angeles. And from that point, we went on to school. Now, I was in, uh, sent to uh, the university in Oxnard, uh, Washington. And uh, that was a, the school was a really a, a normal school. A normal school is what they call then uh, it was an education school. And um, uh, uh, did the, the five months in at that, and then went back and and um, uh, tried some more military training, <laughs> and then they finally sent us to flight schools. I started out in Oxnard uh, private training base. Uh, went from Oxidard uh, in uh, uh, J-28s, uh, now known as Bomber. It was a really a, a name that we gave the airplane, an old stagger wing type thing. Then from there we went to basic training, which was 
basic training with uh, military aircraft it was a J-13, um, a little higher powered engine, and uh, you, had, uh, you flew with an instructor for a couple of hours, and three or four, then you got to fly the thing by yourself. And then from there we went to uh, Douglas, Arizona, to warn to fly uh, the school that we were sent to. Douglas was a military school for multi-engine flight, and um, you, and all of these assignments. Uh, you, you knew had and had no, no knowledge of what was going to come out of it. It was just whatever the men, the, your instructors, and uh, through the schools, uh, your degree was given, and they they introduced you to it. What did they decide that you would be doing? Well, in, in well, the engine school, that was the final for. Light wings and you get your get your wings and becoming a, a pilot. Uh, that school and multi-engine school was actually a school that taught how to handle multi-engine aircraft. Uh, there are other schools that, that that actually catered to fighter squadrons, but uh, in the Training along as they, went to, uh, as they would make a decision why that's what you were sent to. N n no particular choices were ever made or uh, witness. Do you want to go there? Um, none of that. In other words, it was uh, cut and dried, and you were going to go here or you're going to go there. Well, I wound up. In in uh, at uh, Douglas Field in uh, Arizona, that um, I didn't particularly care. I I, I uh, wanted to go uh, to uh, twin engine school. I thought mine. Uh, in fact, I was I was looking. Uh, kind of hoping that I would make B-26s, but the, the, the powers above me started out and said, you're going to go to uh, Roswell, New Mexico, because that's where the B-17 training made it. And uh, wound up in Roswell, and, 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 and I uh, finished my flight training uh, in flying B-17s at that particular base. And then from that point, we w w went to a training camp for uh, the, an entire crew. And here again, uh, I had no choice. Uh, it was, it was whoever put the names together, that was the way it came out. And uh, I had people... Uh, that graduated with me uh, as a co-pilot. I was assigned to a first pilot school. Now, uh, those again were just lux of the draw uh, that uh, you you did what they, somebody determined that you could do, and uh, that's how we were various bases assigned to that. But. Um, I liked the, the, the after I got there. I really liked the B-17. It was a nice, nice, easy flying aircraft, and uh, I really enjoyed flying it. How long were you with your crew before you were sent to war? We actually the crew had uh, at Alexandria, uh, Louisiana, two months. We were there total of 60 days and um, in that we uh, of course I was pilot and uh, my co-pilot was 
a fellow that was in my class of graduation, advanced training. So we were all pretty much knowledgeable one or another, but uh, it was kind of strange getting used, used to it because uh, at that point is when they assigned us crew for uh, going overseas. In other words, we picked up the co-pilot, the, the engineer, the radio operator, the ball turret, uh, the two waist gunners, and the tail gunner. Now, we also picked up uh, the navigator, Hood, and the, nav and the bombardier, Louis Freighter. Uh, these were all brought in, uh, the, 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 never made before, but all of us arriving on the base at one time and the saving, and we were all kind of looking around at one another and wondering, well, did he come from somewhere? And lo and behold, they said, this is your crew, go fly. And that's, <laughs> that's what we did. And it was kind of a funny thing. We really didn't have any friendship there. It was just, this is your crew, go fly. And uh, uh, I really think that we did. Just that. Tell us about your first assignment in World War II. Well, the first assignment that we got in uh, World War II uh, was that um, as pilot, I had to fly five missions before the crew. And um, that's um, kind of how we got started. Now, they had to sit on the ground waiting for me to come back in case we didn't make it back. But uh, at the end of five missions for me, then they could start flying missions. And, and they had to fly with me. So I would say that uh, we really um, started out on bombing runs just normal everyday bombing runs, uh, no no difference in uh, difficulty or expected difficulties or uh, anti-aircraft fire or aircraft fire. Nothing was just just woo and wherever they told us to go, that's where we went, and they really. Uh, uh, when they had the briefing uh, on the morning of your flight, why they told you where you were going and just gave you your airplane number and said, now go start it up and we'll take off and we'll, the leader will lead us on the bomb run. And we did that. Um, really, uh, uh, I think that the crew had uh, a, a big awakening too because uh, all of the uh, bombing runs we were on, all of the uh, missions that we flew were bombing runs and you had to fly in tight grouped formation. Now, there was a distinction in formation flying. The 15th Air Force to which we belonged under uh, General Akers flew what we called formation. It was called a diamond formation. Lead ship, right and left of uh, wing men, fourth, fifth, just below, and then tail going. Charlie was number seven that was down below. Now, flooring in formation is pretty tough work. You had to be able to withstand the turbulence in the air, had to be able to stay within formation flying distances, and uh, when it especially when on the bomb run, everybody was supposed to tighten up, and you flew so that your aircraft was about 10 feet from the other aircraft. And uh, that was considered uh, adequate space between wingtips was 10 feet. Now, 
that was a little bit frightening to the uh, <laughs> crew members because well, we didn't have a, we did have some formation flying back in the states, but uh, it was no, nothing to what it was in flying. Uh, and as I say, uh, even I hadn't done this. Uh, it was take off three minutes, uh, and we had seven men in the air. You had to take off within 20 seconds of the lead ahead. He uh, wasn't even off the ground when you started your uh, takeoff run. And so that was kind of a frightening thing, really, because a guy up ahead, he's still on the ground and you're taking off too. So it, it, it was a little, little bit uh, difficult for the enlisted personnel. They hadn't done this before, and they thought it was a little bit, a little bit risky. But we all did it, and did, came out, and uh, everybody was happy with it. Tell us about some of the missions that you participated in World War Two. Um, gee whiz, uh, some of the missions. Uh, they, they all kind of run together. They were all about the same. The only thing that, that um, I remember that I was really proud of uh, was the fact that in the division of the two air forces, the 8th Air Force in England and the 15th Force in Italy, uh, we in Italy had never gone to May to Berlin. They never had an admission because that was classified as a target area for the 8th Air Force, and so we didn't go. But lo and behold, our particular commander decided that we needed to ex experience the Berlin type of uh, air defenses. So long about the time and I thought we were getting ready to come home, they said, uh, a crew, uh, we're going to Berlin and get your airplanes ready. Now, this was a case where uh, the Berlin mission was so far away that what we had to do was take off uh, and uh, we got into formation on climbing out to our altitude. Uh, that we were assigned at uh, on the way up to, towards Berlin. So it's kind of a straggling type of formation flying, but, but we finally, by the time we got up to Graz, Italy, uh, which is at the very top of the Adriatic Peninsula, uh, it, we all were able to get into f formation there. Now, the reason you went to what formation was to cut back on on the bomb run losses, uh, especially where they used uh, aircraft as a, as a uh, deterrent. Um, we had several uh, people lost on that drain, and the reasoning was when we went to Berlin, that the Germans had just determined that the jet engine and their P-263 could actually do the job of, of defense. Well, the jet engine was such a fast airplane that, that when they made a pass at you, they only had about, oh, maybe three or four seconds to, to line you up, shoot, and then they were beyond you. And um, flying that type of mission, well, what we were afraid of was the jet engine, but uh, it found out that the jet with a slow-flying aircraft was really no match anyway. Uh, uh, that uh, A fighter that's going that fast doesn't have much time to to sit there and sight you and shoot and then get away. 
and um, so that was a, it was a learning experience on our part that uh, we could do this and and, and manage to get home with it and uh, oh, uh, we got a, a unit of citation for that the unit of citation was a, what our uh, uh, federal government thought we should get a citation you got a little little medal for it and, and a lot of write up in the paper but, but um, our particular squadron had seven aircraft in that particular uh, bomb run and uh, we all got home uh, some of the uh, some of the squadrons didn't uh, fare so well that uh, uh, the 8th, 15th, they lost three airplanes. And uh, the 8th, uh, 15th lost one or two. 8th, 40th, they lost four. The actual fly was because we were in formation, uh, going up and going back, uh, formation flying, you couldn't use the full speed of the aircraft. You could only go 160 miles an hour. So we're, we're, we're flying along at about 160 for uh, halfway up and halfway back. When we got back down from the target towards our base at Graz, uh, Yugoslavia, uh, we, we didn't really... Uh, stay in tight formations and kind of slipped out a little bit and kind of loped along by ourselves. How long were you flying for on that mission? In that mission? In that mission, uh, the actual, uh, because of the fact that the, we had to form up rather in uh, a, a Hitler Skelter type idea, we were in that tight formation ever since we got to the coast of northern Italy. The actual flight time back into the airport was 15 hours. Now, uh, formation flying was probably as much as seven hours of that, uh, because, as I say, would we come back and we were no longer in enemy fighter area we all just kind of slipped out and didn't have to fly tight as we normally would how old were you and your crew members well i wasn't even 21 yet when i was flying my missions uh, I started out and I managed to turn to 21 by the time I got on the Berlin Mid. And I was considered an old man at 20. Now, uh, my navigator uh, was maybe a year or two older than I was, and, and we thought we were pretty old people. Uh, the uh, bombardier was the oldest man. He was married, uh, had a wife and kids, and uh, he was what we call the grandfather of the aircraft. And he treated it like an aircraft. <laughs> was <laughs> uh, he was he was really a nut, but. Um, uh, Hood, he was married. He was pretty old. Uh, real smart guy, a real technical type individual. Uh, the Palmer was, uh, he was 21. He was the flight engineer. Uh, Gutowski, uh, the radio operator, uh, he was married, but he was only 18. Uh, Smitty, the ball turret man, he was uh, 18, fudged 18. I don't think he was quite 18 years old when he was with us. Uh, he got a little older when he got home. But 
the waist gunner, uh, to add, I only went over uh, seas with one waist gunner. We had two, but I only had one going over seas. And um, he was, uh, Patrick was a football type player. And uh, I don't remember just how old he was, but he was going to school and uh, rather than get drafted, he, like me, joined the Army. <laughs> um, uh, Hughes, the tail gunner, uh, Hughes was only around 20. Uh, he, he might have been 20, but 19 or 20. Uh, we, we were all pretty young at, on that, that mission. Uh, now, some missions had pilots that were a little older than that. Not that the, you had any choice, but uh, you, you had, depending on the age and so forth, uh, some of the people uh, that were assigned were had a little older, but uh, basically uh, at my 21, I was an old man. Tell us about your work with the Tuskegee Airmen. Oh, the Tuskegee was a real honest-to-goodness group. It was uh, what we would call a black group, and uh, we didn't pay any attention to that. I don't think that anyone over there really objected to it, but uh, they were a good P-51 group, and they would fly missions that escort us to targets and back. Uh, I remember we went to one time to uh, Linz, uh, Austria, and we had Tuskegee Airmen on that mission, where we actually had German fighters, but uh, the Tuskegee Airmen took care of them. And uh, actually, uh, any of the missions I went on, and I think there were only about basic two, two or, or three that we ever had uh, their uh, aircraft as uh, chauffeurs, and uh, they had a distinguished record of having lost no aircraft uh, while they were on the mission. As, as leaders and so forth, protection. You had some trouble on your 13th mission. Tell us about that. Oh, well, I, that was uh, a milk run. And, and of course, we, we, we call milk runs as something where we're not going up to a real fancy target or has lots of uh, guns around it or airplanes to guard it. Um, a milk run is something where you get in and you go up there, come back, and take credit for a mission, but you really didn't do a thing. And on this particular milk run, uh, we started out uh, on a bomb run at an altitude of 28,000 feet. And on uh, the fact that we got there 20 minutes ahead of time, they decided that better do a 360-degree turn uh, because there were other groups already on the target. So we did. We would drop down from 28,000 to 24,000 feet and bomb run on the 24,000-foot level. Well, uh, not too many guns down there shooting at us, but... The fact that they know where we are and at what altitude their shooting was accurate. And as we were going tooling in towards the target, we get hit in the number three engine, which immediately killed the three and four engine. That put me in a very steep left bank uh, and uh, it took a little while to recover the aircraft, get it back to flying, but um, in so doing, we lost about, oh, we lost anywhere from 
two to three thousand feet. I really don't remember how many, but it was close to close to three thousand feet that we lost. And uh, the, the, when we dropped down, uh, the people shooting at us were looking up at us, almost could throw snowballs up at us and hit us. Uh, we were that close to the ground because um, uh, when you when you figured that. Uh, our bomb run was at uh, 28,000 feet, and the uh, gun placement was at the six to 8,000 foot in the mountains range. Uh, you subtract that from the 28, then you take off a four more, you're down around 16,000 feet to 14 to 16,000 feet for the gunners down below you to shoot at you. Well. That's like uh, that's like shooting chickens in a coop. <laughs> they they had us lay, lined up and, and let us have it. Well, hit uh, on November three. I finally got the aircraft around, started headed home, uh, dropped the bombs. And we don't know where they went, but we just dropped the bombs headed on down through the Po Valley, and uh, that was the only place where I could see level ground. Uh, Italy is a country uh, of n nothing more than rolling hills, steep angled mountains, and uh, lots of guns to shoot at you. So I was going down there where I could see fairly level ground, I knew what side the uh, the aircraft uh, on two engines was flying fairly good. The only thing is we were losing altitude. So well, I got down to the Po Valley entrance, uh, just at a town called Ferrara, and I noticed along we would feel there that uh, looked like a good landing field if I had to land and. Uh, in the meantime, I decided that it was a lot safer to have the crew go with me rather than bail out, because safety in numbers, and uh, I figured that would be the, the safest way to get us get us home. Then I, I did. We turned towards uh, our base when we left Ferrara. And I, just about the time I finished turning, getting the airplane down, we were a little lower than 7,000 feet. But then the engines on the right, left side of the aircraft, numbers one and two, ran out of fuel. So now we have an airplane up in the air with no fuel, no engines running. And what do we do now? <laughs> uh, uh, God. What do we do now? And so I turned the airplane back around because I had seen this wheat field uh, uh, coming over and thought that was a good place to go. So we turned back and we just had enough altitude uh, to, as the aircraft settled to, to try to make a crash landing on, on that wheat field. And uh, we did. And the aircraft came to a halt, finally, uh, at the end of where we were landing was a farmhouse. And I thought we were going to go through the farmhouse the way the aircraft was sliding on the ground, but it finally, the bomb bay, uh, the ball in the bomb bay hit and the aircraft went up on its nose. And then after it's on its nose, it made it a 360 degree turn and came back down and as it came back down the aircraft hit the ball that broke it in half and so uh, that put a stop to it the only thing was that wasn't a farmhouse down there that was a German command post it was the command post for uh, artillery 
uh, because the new English were in that section of the country they were going to start the campaign to clear Italy and end the war. Well, <laughs> that was the wrong thing for me to do, but nevertheless, we were captured the minute we got on the ground. It was, uh, in fact, uh, they were even shooting at us while we were on the ground, putting holes in the airplane. But uh, they didn't shoot at anybody, but uh, the, they were still shooting. And uh, we all got got captured and lined up and moved, marched into the what we said was a farmhouse. It was actually, a, as I said, a German officer command post. And the farmhouse itself was a barracks, a personnel barracks. And uh, they uh, lined us all up. And they took Hood and I into the uh, officer's quarters inside and uh, made us sit down on the floor. And uh, after sitting down for a while, I, the head man, uh, I think was a total, was a major, uh, came in and said, for you, the war is over. I said, I didn't know it was even on. <laughs> I was just just there, but uh, he said, "No, he said, for you the war is over." And until I got outside again, I didn't understand what he was telling me the war was over. But I got outside, and then uh, Gatowski, the radio operator said, they were going to shoot us. I said, oh, you got to be kidding. They wouldn't shoot you. Oh, yes, yes. He says, I'm Polish. And one of the guards was Polish, and we spoke. He said, they were going to shoot you all. And I said, oh, you got to be kidding. Get out. No, he tells us, uh, he come up on bicycle, on uh, motorcycle, and he gets off and he eats the guards out and he says he chews on them for about 30 minutes before and then, then it marches us back here. We were at the canal over there. And we were going to be in the canal. He said, they were going to shoot us. I said, well, they didn't. And he, uh, so the following day, they put us together, and then, and then they split uh, uh, Hood and I and uh, 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 another guy, I don't remember who it was, three of us, uh, and they were divided up into threes and uh, marched off towards Ferraro again, going to the town of Ferraro to uh, uh, German war machine main headquarters in there and uh, we all got there and uh, they put us in, in uh, their interrogation center the Hood and I and another pilot from a B-25 group uh, off of Corsica that was with us and they took us into the main interrogation center, sent the others on a walking campaign uh, all the way to Verona, uh, in northern Italy. Um, I was in the uh, interrogation center for seven or eight days, and then we went outside, and they lined us up, and gave us two guards. One guard was a, a handicapped individual, one that had been wounded or something, and the other one was a relatively uh, good-speaking German. 
and they was to take us to prison. And uh, the prison was in Munich, Germany. Uh, did in Moosburg, just north of, uh, uh, just north of Munich. And so we all went on, and we would have to go by whatever conveyance they could get. If a truck came along, we rode the truck. Uh, they had a truck with a damaged tank on it, and we got on that and rode for some uh, miles uh, on that. And then we got into a uh, mountain area, and uh, the uh, Italians were smart. We bombed the bridges that got to, from the tunnels. So what they would do, uh, take a train, go from one end of the tunnel to the other end of the tunnel, turn around and come back, go back and forth, and take people and whatever on the, these trips. The, the, uh, so that was where the, the, we all split up again. And as I say, uh, when we got to Mooseburg, uh, Mooseburg was a cheese factory. And there was a huge, tall smokestack. But uh, we got off the train and uh, right outside of Mooseburg and it started into the town that took us through the cheese factory. When we got to the cheese factory, we could see inside. This cheese factory had stripped all this metal out in order for them to have steel to make uh, uh, the barracks uh, in there had 12 bunks on top of one another. So if you had an upper bunk, you had to crawl out, you had to come down, uh, whatever level you were off of, uh, and to the floor. If you wanted to go to the bathroom at night, <laughs> you had a hard time coming down those 12 high. That's pretty good size. That's 12 high, put it about, oh, a little over 20 feet. So, <laughs> uh, uh, it was it was uh, the people that lived over there had a had a real complaint, but we actually in uh, the, the prison camp there at Mooseburg, uh, army barracks was at the end of the uh, prison camp row, and what we had uh, what we were assigned to luck of the draw, uh, uh, was a barracks that was in an isolation unit. Two barracks were in an isolation unit that had barbed wire around them. That was an isolation unit. It was for the sick people to be sent to this isolation unit for recovery. Well, uh, there was no recovery needed. To <laughs> we were in there and stuck, and of course, we're we're sitting there with we can't get out we can't go anywhere we're stuck with two two barracks and uh, uh, the guards are not too far from it and uh, uh, it was a, a good thing I guess because we all got out and got alive and kept alive and. Uh, when Patton uh, was headed into Mooseburg, uh, he sent a contingent over with a big tank, and the tank drove through the front gate. Well, that opened up the camp then, so the people could leave. And many of them did. Many of them tried to go back to their units, but uh, they rounded you up and put you on an transport of some variety and took you to Lahore, France and shipped you home on a boat. 
So when you were a prisoner, where were you held? Oh, we were held at uh, Stalag 7A, which is, uh, there were many Stalags, and this happened to be 7A. Uh, as the war would progress and the camps would be overrun, they would actually move the prisoners back down to uh, another area that hadn't been overrun yet, and then vice versa they came along. When they were on, then they just moved people from one camp to another camp, trying to keep them. Well, they never disposed of the um, prisoners. They never really tried to minimize uh, movement. They just simply put them on a boat or on a ship or on a train or on a truck, uh, foot, and, and you march to another location. Um, 7A, 7B, 7C, 7D. There were actually four prison camps right there together. But we were in 7A, which was designed for English people. Uh, there were English and uh, some French, but basically Americans. And uh, there were roughly, in that particular compound at the war's end, over 100,000 American pr pr prisoners. Now, when we actually got to it, and they actually released us, uh, we actually had well beyond uh, 200,000 because we had Russians, we had uh, French, we had uh, Balkan countries, we had other uh, prisoners that they had had. So it was kind of a conglomeration of numbers of prisoners, and they were all in this A through B, C, D series of dogs seven. So we don't know what the actual total count was, but because some of them, as they say, as they were liberated, the people took off, especially the Russians and the uh, Balkan areas, they they took off. Uh, and I don't blame them for doing so uh, because they had to get home and so forth. And the only way they were going to get home was walk anyhow. So oh, they managed to, to do that. Now, I think in terms of what we had to eat, that was something that uh, I want to say was next to nothing. We always were issued uh, two people, one Red Cross parcel uh, at uh, Sunday on every other week, in regards of the Sunday. It was every other week for two men and a Red Cross parcel. Now, a Red Cross parcel held in it five cigarettes. Now, that cigarette was an act of gold. You could take that cigarette and you could wave it around there and people would actually bid on the price of that cigarette so they could have something to smoke. Uh, really, we didn't have what you'd call uh, good food over there either. I'll tell you, what we had beyond the Red Cross parcel was boiled cabbage. Now, boiled cabbage that was cooked on Wednesday was served to us on Saturday. What boiled cabbage was cooked on Saturday was served to us on Wednesday. 
Now, if you don't know what cold boiled cabbage is, <laughs> don't try it. it. It's not worth it. But that was the summon of the very, and now you got a loaf of bread. And now I got to the point where I liked the bread. The bread was actually made of a, a material uh, much like we would have a uh, uh, a wheat loaf bread. Their bread was like that, but then it was taken out and rolled in sawdust. The sawdust was a preservative. Instead of wrapping it in paper, they wrapped it in sawdust, baked that, and that's the way you got it. Now you got it and you ate the sawdust too. And I got to the point where I liked it. I could, I could trade my cigarette, one cigarette, and I could get a full loaf of bread so I could, could eat something like that. And, and that's how, what I lived on while I was in there. Tell us about how you felt when you were released from prison. You know, it's a funny thing. I, I really don't remember uh, particularly uh, uh, thinking beyond the fact that I needed to get home. Uh, I, I, I was happy to be released. That, that's true. Everybody had to be happy, uh, even though they weren't going to get home very quick. They still had to be happy. They didn't have to live in those camps. That we had food brought in, and and we were able to eat some things that they brought us uh, in in field type service things. We didn't get uh, military stuff. We actually got hot foods. Um, but actually, as far as euphoria is concerned, I, I really didn't, didn't feel like uh, that uh, we had anything accomplished and that uh, the, the really getting home part was still to, to do. And uh, I really wasn't what you'd call upset or an idea and wasn't ready to run around the country and go uh, uh, sightseeing. Some of the people did. Uh, and then it was, uh, I met some in later prison uh, uh, camps that uh, went out on their own and on the side and tried to get back to their units and so forth and didn't make it, but nevertheless, uh, once they were found or picked up, they'd ship them home anyway. Where did you go when you were released from prison? Where did I go? All right, there were so many of us that we had to wait in the prison camp five days for them to organize transportation. What it was, uh, at uh, the military base at Landshut, Germany, which was just north of us, uh, they took us up there in tr trucks from the prison camp to Landshut and just set us down on the ground out there. No, no buildings, no nothing. Landshut, and then what happened is in the, late in the afternoon, a flight of C-47s, what we call C-6s, uh, set down on the ground. They loaded those up with people by just uh, calling names and numbers and um, organization units uh, and put them on the airplane and then flew them to Lahore, France. Now, Lahore, France, they would put him in various locations, and uh, you'd have two or three days in order to get a ride home on a boat. And it was a case of the ports there were constantly rotating uh, ships 
uh, what we call uh, Mammy Oakham's uh, trying uh, ships that the people had built uh, that uh, we we took. Uh, oh, I would say possibly a cruise ship or. Uh, old old tubs anyway. They were, it was a god awful looking out uh, the ship that we were on, but uh, we rode that back to Boston, and uh, while we didn't go in 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 uh, convoy going home, we were in, uh, we had we passed ships and we had ships passing passing us. And then when you got to La Harbor, uh, got uh, home to Boston, uh, you had to wait in the harbor till they could dock you. And, and then when the, we, we docked uh, there, and the, uh, you you couldn't get off the boat until they put a row of cars, railroad cars, in there. Uh, and then when you got off, you had to get off on the car and find the car that you get off on. Now, what they had was a car like uh, the first one at the very end was um, New York. Now, if you lived in New York and so forth, you got on that car and, and you actually had cars signed. And then we had a car uh, that was actually signed for Salt Lake City, and that was fairly near the engine, fairly near. Uh, but then you had this train moving down, and it would go from city to city. City, New York was one. Philadelphia was another. Uh, oh. There was some, uh, Cleveland was another stop, I remember. Uh, then you got down to Chicago. And then from there you started west. You went to Omaha. And then you went from, from there to Denver. And then from Denver to Salt Lake. And, and uh, as I say, uh, these cars would be, just be dismantled from the train, and they would pick those cars back up on the return trip to Boston, so that they had a continual uh, road uh, of, of vehicles going up and down the road, taking prisoners home. And now, some of the prisoners, like I remember, it took us three days to get from Boston to Salt Lake City, uh, and. And uh, uh, that was where you had Red Cross parcels. You had to have Red Cross parcels to, to carry you along the way in order to get to home. And uh, finally, when I got home, I got off the train in Salt Lake City. I went to a telephone and it took a dime to operate. I didn't have any money. So I hung that back up and I went and found a, uh, a phone on a, on a person's desk. He wasn't there at the desk so I used his phone and I called a number that I thought I had remembered as being my sister's. Well, it wasn't, but nevertheless, <laughs> I, I, I got the, the, those people to, to give me the seal's address, and I called her and told her I was coming home, uh, and I'm going to, uh, to ride a taxi. Well, I rode the taxi, but I didn't have any money to pay the driver. So I got out of the car, went into the house, and said, Lucille, I'm here, but you got to pay for me. And so, uh, the, the, her reception was, I'm home, but I've got to pay the money. Spend the money. Uh, 
But that was one of the, the things that I remember. Getting home was 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 a uh, still part of the of the cycle of uh, the war, and and it was really uh, uh, if I could say it was a better word, uh, it was fun. I enjoyed all of the trips and the hardware. I enjoyed going through the trauma of making exercises. I really had a, a, a good time doing that. And I, I enjoyed uh, so much the, the, the things that we did over there that uh, I was kind of, kind of sorry that I couldn't take advantage of them again. Not only were you involved in World War II, but you were also involved in the Korean War. What happened in the Korean War for you? Well, I got to go to the Korean War only because I wanted to fly. And I had joined an active reserve wing, and I was a reservist in Miami. Uh, uh, it was uh, a case of where we were flying and called them back to fly at the start of the Korean War. The only thing was we were to be a cadre of personnel assigned to Korea to fly for missions that whatever they needed over there. Uh, And um, it was a case where uh, when we flew our missions here, uh, you were appraised at how long you were in the German prison camp and how long you were overseas. And that was your uh, safety valve was if you'd been over there for any length of time. Uh, but those of us who had been there a short time, we got to go to Korea. And and uh, after spending some time in Miami, uh, flying around the country, uh, military stuff, uh, junk stuff, uh, we got to sent to Japan. Now, I was thought we'd go to Korea, but they didn't. They put us in a little base called Brady Field in Fukuoka, Japan. Uh, and that base was C-46 aircraft, twin engine, uh, looked like a, a whale, uh, a big whale. But uh, those were troop carrier things that were required over there. And uh, really, what we did was we would go on missions up there, pick up people to Tokyo, and deliver them wherever they were going, and then wherever they were going, pick up people there to come back, and come back, and you, we, we, we did that in a rotation basis. Uh, um, after a while, I flew some, uh, uh, Chanel had started Korean Airlines over there, and, and uh, so we would pick up some of his people, uh, fly an airplane from Tokyo to Seoul, fly the airplane from Seoul towards Formosa, get out of the seat, and the Korean pilots would take over and fly to Japan, uh, fly, I mean, to Formosa, and then fly back to uh, Japan. They'd get near Japan, an American crew had to take over and fly them and land in Tokyo. That was a, a blooming stupid war. Uh, that said, 
only military people can fly within this zone. Well, we flew the zone and then the Korean people would take over and fly the zone that they were in. And when we would go into Formosa, they'd put us in the barracks and keep us overnight and then put us on an airplane the following day and we flew into Tokyo. But, uh, all we carried, all we carried were personnel. Now, uh, they, we would have some generals, we would have some enlisted personnel, we would have some military, we'd have some Navy personnel, we'd have some, uh, a good number of, of Korean people uh, that we would fly around. And finally, when we get home, we find out the people that we were flying were CIA and the FBI <laughs> people. And that this was a way of communicating uh, with uh, personnel. So I, I really didn't do too much in Korea. Uh, I went there, but that was, uh, I didn't have to. I didn't have to go up north. I wanted to, but I didn't. Didn't get into it. Uh, all we did was what we called flu trash people. I enjoyed the interview and thank you for your service. Well, thank you, sweetheart. I enjoyed talking to you and I hope we've given you some good information. Thank you. Bye-bye.